We shall now start, with, start the interactive dialogue with the Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Eritrea. Delegations wishing to inscribe on the list of speakers should do so by using the electronic system, which will be opened shortly. It is now my pleasure to welcome to the podium Ms. Sheila Kitaruth, thank you very much, uh, Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Eritrea. Before I give the floor to the mandate holder, I would like to ask the Secretariat to activate the electronic system for inscription on the list of speakers. And you'll have one minute uh, to do so. Oh, it's showing in front of me. Oh, okay. Um, let me also announce that uh, the list of speakers will close in 15 minutes, so we still have an opportunity uh, to inscribe. Let me now invite uh, Madam Sheila. Sorry, I don't think I was on the microphone. I was saying that you have 15 minutes uh, to, to close uh, on the list of speakers and to give Madam, and that she has 10 minutes to present her report. Madam. Thank you very much, Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I present my third report in my capacity as Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Eritrea. The main thrust of this report is related to forced evictions and demolitions as a violation of the right to adequate housing in Eritrea. Such demolitions have had drastic impacts on individuals, families and communities, leading to the denial of multiple rights. I also provide an update on, broader situation, on the broader situation of human rights in Eritrea since I presented my second report. I would like to reassure all that in undertaking two independent mandates of the Human Rights Council, namely the Special Rapporteurship and membership in the Commission of Inquiry, I sought to ensure the integrity of both mandates was maintained. With regards to cooperation and access, I'm still looking forward to an opportunity to visit Eritrea at the invitation of the government, and I hope it is forthcoming. Threats your Excellencies, to the right to adequate housing posed by forced evictions have been amplified in Eritrea since the beginning of 2015. Forced evictions represent an ongoing practice and the authorities have bulldozed scores of houses directly affecting hundreds of households. I received information concerning recent demolitions of approximately 800 houses in Asmara and in several other villages in the vicinity of Asmara as well as in other towns such as Adike. About 3,000 people were made homeless due, owing to the forced evictions and demolitions. These figures represent conservative estimates collated from different sources as no official statistics are available regarding the number of houses torn down, the number of people displaced, the number of people injured, the number of those who lost their lives during the evictions, more specifically in Adikei. In Adikei, 
to, uh, town residents opposed to demolitions and evictions fiercely leading um, to physical confrontations between high school children and the military. I received reports that at least two people who stood in the way of the military to save their homes or during protests were allegedly killed or on or about the 5th of March this year. A dozen of high school students were taken into custody when they tried to stop the demolitions and because of their participation in protest. There is little evidence that the state authorities took any proactive measures to inform those facing evictions of the demolitions. The impact has been greater on more vulnerable groups of society, including women, children and the elderly. To summarize land distribution for the purpose of housing in Eritrea, one interviewee had this to say which reflects the views of many. The policy for allocating land and construction of houses is problematic and inconsistent for the lay person. Government gives you land and you need to get permission to build. After waiting for a long time, some people try to build without the permission of government and at some point the government will come and tell them to discontinue construction or destroy the houses. On the other hand, some officials and others are able to build houses without any government intervention. It is not clear what the process is for getting permission to build and when you ask, they always blame it on higher officials. It is only when you finish that they intervene. Ladies and gentlemen, the plight of unaccompanied Eritrean minors crossing the international borders is becoming increasingly visible, revealing a population characterized by heightened vulnerability. Eritrean minors manage the journeys across the borders into neighboring countries and then through the desert and across the Mediterranean Sea. They risk falling prey to many forms of abuse, including sexual, economic, criminal, and these minors represent a group with special protection needs. Since my first encounter with children in such situations in 2013, I have continued to bring their predicament to the attention of the international community. The consequences of these death-defying journeys are too dire to bear and the impact on unaccompanied minors could be everlasting, leaving them traumatized for life. They are indeed in need of your protection. Distinguished delegates, I was encouraged by signs, still very few, I admit, that Eritrea is increasing its engagement with the international community. I welcome such an outward-looking step as an unequivocal measure by the state to abide fully by its human rights obligations. However, we need to see more concrete evidence that the situation of human rights in Eritrea is set to improve. We've talked about the uh, indefinite conscription and the announcement, but they were unconfirmed as far as the Special Rapporteur is concerned, like there have been in the past that the current round, the 28th round of national service, would last for the prescribed 18 months. Yet there is nothing concrete and official to that effect which has come to the knowledge of the Special Rapporteur. Despite the existence of legislation which uh, stipulates this 18 month, it has not been respected. So it would appear that conscripts and their families would need to wait for the summer for 18 months to pass before actually seeing whether in fact they would serve 18 months or not. This is the kind of arbitrariness which is indeed pervasive. Now, with regards to the accession of uh, Eritrea to the Convention Against Torture, a welcome move indeed. However, the committee didn't, uh, it, the Eritrea did not accept the Committee Against Torture's inquiry procedure 
under Article 20 of the Convention providing for an investigation which may include a fact-finding mission to the country should the, com uh, the Committee obtain reliable information containing well-founded indication that torture was being practiced in the territory of the State Party. My question is, why do things halfway? Why not go to the whole length of it? There are still hundreds of prisoners in detention, some incommunicado, without charge or trial, and without the possibility of challenging the legality of their detention. For example, scores of soldiers, family members, as well as relatives who may have been remotely connected through family ties, have been arrested and detained arbitrarily in the aftermath of the incident on the 21st of January 2013, which has been called the Forto Incident. So, for a few of those who have been released recently, including the journalists released in January 2015, one would ask the question, how many are still arbitrarily detained? The G15 remain a case in point. One commendable action is the coming into force of the following laws, the Civil Code, Penal Code, Code of Civil Procedure, and the Code of Criminal Procedure, which had remained in transitional modes since, um, since 1991. However, what I would say is that these codes have entered into force into the context of a constitutional void, as the 1997 constitution remains unimplemented today and is reportedly subject to review. I therefore conclude that one would need to see concrete actions rather than vague promises that the government of Eritrea was willing to be more compliant with its international human rights uh, obligation. I would, uh, I would uh, stop here for now and would like to take other questions and other issues as we go along, mindful of time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam. Uh, very gracious to you. Colleagues, we shall start by hearing the delegation of the country concerned. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Eritrea. You have five minutes. Mr. Vice President, in responding to the special rapporteur report, my delegation would only make some critical reflections on few issues of essence, but in general believe that this report is totally unproductive and unacceptable. Moreover, the fact that the duplicate mandates on Eritrea have been created clearly exposes the political intention of intimidating and harassing the country, its people and government. By its own admission, the special rapporteur was also frank to indicate the challenge created to the establishment of duplicate mandates. To add insult to injury, the position of Eritrea and some members of the Council who leveled their reservation and opposition to the creation of the duplicate mechanism, not to mention that this country-specific mechanisms are undesirable. It is in this context and attesting the experience of the last three years that Eritrea reiterates its strong position in opposition to the politically motivated country-specific resolutions and mechanisms which lack the consent of the concerned country, Eritrea. Additionally, it has been clear from the experience of the last three years that this special mandate with investigative responsibilities have been abused and used for other ulterior motives. In fact, the Eritrean government did protest officially to the activist-like approach of targeting Eritrea in an open collaboration with subversive groups against the country. This has led to the biased position of the mandate holders throughout the last three years and has been reflected in various dimensions of the recent report. Mr. Vice President, the sensational port portrayal of Eritrea and the Eritrean society as a society without any sort of participation, participation in the affairs of the country, above all, is deplorable. The perceived coercion on the people by the government and the looming fear of reprisals that hinders participation alluded by the special rapporteur is totally unfounded. Time and again, my delegation has outlined that the characteristic feature of the Eritrean society 
born out of the necessities of the harmonious culture, the dynamics of the liberation struggle, and the pragmatic efforts of nation building, has made responsible participation at all levels of the society a reality. The involvement of communities and citizens in public is very high, and in fact the myths created by the Special Rapporteur as well as the COI to insult the high level of community voluntary participation in all activities of the community and the nation is unfounded. This emanates from the value and policy of ascertaining the decisiveness of the human factor in nation building. Furthermore, equal rights and opportunity has prevailed and there is no discrimination, exclusion, etc. by the government on the basis of ethnicity, social background and re religious affiliation. In the present report, again, a new dimension that took a hated and sensational narrative is the forced eviction. Let it be clear that in any country, the housing development is managed in line to the urban planning set and based on the land policy, housing development regulations and requ requirements. The government has always directed that land use and housing constructions has to follow the basic laws and policies. This is a simple, standard and well-taken fact and experience it everywhere. On the other hand, human trafficking and migration deserves also some attention in this response. Eritrea has always been combating illegal immigration and the scourge of human trafficking affecting the lives of our citizens. Recently, also Eritrea has been involved in the cartoon process for combating illegal immigration and human trafficking. Continuous dialogue is also taking place with the EU delegation on this issue. There are fundamental issues which the report totally sidelines, however, and has focused on pinpointing figures, fingers on Eritrea, which is unacceptable and requires an objective stance on the governance of migration. This includes the continuous efforts to lure the young Eritrean generation, the preferential treatment given to Eritreans by some Western countries, the continuous efforts made to attract them to the heavenly life in the West, the failed and manipulated political asylum case orchestrated on Eritreans, and the fact that in the end this complicated situation has been exploited by other nationals of the region claiming asylum in the name of Eritreans. On the other hand, my delegation, as was repeatedly highlighted, brings to the attention of the Council the ongoing efforts to promote international cooperation on human rights, which, en which encompasses the major dimensions highlighted in my previous response. In light of the above position development, in conclusion, Mr. Vice President, my delegation would like to seize this opportunity to once again assure my government's commitment to promote and protect genuine human rights for its citizens. In this context, it urges the Council to consider engagement, cooperation and institutional links to avoid the confrontational approach by abandoning the country's specific resolutions and mechanisms imposed in Eritrea. I thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you. Uh, let me announce that uh, the list of speakers is now closed. I now invite interested delegations to put questions to the mandate holder and to make comments on her report. The speaking time will be three minutes for member states and two minutes for observer states. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the European Union. You have the floor. Mr. Vice President, the European Union would like to warmly thank, uh, thank the Special Rapporteur for her report and for her work, while continuing to regret that the government of Eritrea does not grant her access to the country, the EU takes positive note of the signs, though still considerably few, recorded by the Special Rapporteur towards an increasing engagement of Eritrea with the international community. The European Union strongly encourages the government of Eritrea to pursue this direction. We commend the persistent efforts of the Special Rapporteur to seek collaboration with the authorities and we support the renewal of her mandate. We welcome the focus given by the Special Rapporteur in her report to, to forced evictions and demolition of houses in different parts of Eritrea and share her opinion that the threats to the rights to adequate housing requires further attention. Beyond this specific question, the EU is deeply concerned by the severe and continuous human rights violations in Eritrea. We call on the government of Eritrea to release all prisoners detained without charge or trial 
and to put an immediate stop to torture, cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatments. We invite the government of Eritrea to fully implement without delay the measures aimed at reducing to 18 months the national service and to provide for conscientious objectors various forms of alternative, uh, alternative service of a non-combatant or civilian character. We also invite the government to reconsider its res reservation on Article 20 of the UN Convention Against Torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. We deplore the fate of thousands of Eritreans fleeing the country and we risk capture, torture and death at the hand, hands of ruthless human traffickers and smugglers. In her report, the Special Rapporteur suggested to determine new priority areas and action points to evaluate the progress of the human rights situation in the medium term. We would be interested in knowing which might be new areas uh, that she would like to suggest. I thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. The United Kingdom would like to thank the Special Rapporteur for her work. The UK shares the Special Rapporteur's concerns highlighted in her latest report on issues such as the ongoing threats to the right to housing, as well as the illegal trafficking of Eritrean nationals that has been brought into even sharper focus by the recent tragedies in the Mediterranean. As the Human Rights Council is aware, the continuing issue of human rights abuses within Eritrea, alongside a lack of economic opportunities for young people, is one of the push factors leading Eritreans to undertake the dangerous journey through neighbouring African countries and then across the Mediterranean into Europe. We would be interested to hear the view of the Special Rapporteur on the issue of business and human rights in Eritrea and whether she will look to engage on this issue with international companies that operate there. The UK reaffirms its disappointment that the Government of Eritrea continues to reject the mandate of the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Eritrea and to deny her access to the country. This imposes an additional and unnecessary burden on her in assessing evidence about the human rights situation within Eritrea. We call on the Government of Eritrea to honour its international human rights obligations and to cooperate fully with the whole UN human rights system, including the Special Rapporteur. We believe that the Council should remain seized of this matter. Thank you, Mr Vice President. Thank you. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of New Zealand. Do you have the floor? Thank you, Mr. Vice President. New, New Zealand supported the establishment at the time of the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Eritrea. This was in response to ongoing reports, including from the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, of grave human rights violations against the populations of Eritrea. Several years later, our concern at the situation remains. If anything, that concern has deepened not least due to the continued denial of access and what such a denial represents for this United Nations mandate holder to visit the country and to investigate the situation on the ground. In particular, we are concerned at the reports of grossly inadequate shelter for returning refugees and the internally displaced, as this presents not only an immediate deprivation, but also an ongoing basis of instability in the country and its communities. We are also concerned at the multiple reports of a systemic repre repression by those in authority of a number of forms of civic participation in community and public life in Eritrea. These issues are fundamental to a basic functioning society and without them we fear to see only more instability in the country with all the risks that that entails. Mr Vice President, we're not comfortable at seeing a UN member state isolated and we ask what we as an international community can do to facilitate an opening of cooperation between the Government of Eritrea and the mechanism of the Special Rapporteur. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Ireland. You have the floor. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Ireland welcomes the Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Eritrea and would like to thank Ms. Kitharouth for her report and her presentation today. We remain concerned that three years into her mandate, the Special Rapporteur has not yet been able to gain access to the country in order to carry out her work. We continue to call on the Eritrean government to facilitate this access to allow the Special Rapporteur to assess the human rights situation firsthand. We note positive developments undertaken by the Government of Eritrea since the Special Rapporteur's last report, such as the long overdue entry into force of the Penal Code and the Code of Criminal Procedures. However, we share the concern of the Special Rapporteur that these important laws have come into force in the context of a constitutional void with ineffective implementation of the 1997 Constitution. Ireland fully agrees with the Special Rapporteur's call to the Government of Eritrea to strengthen efforts to increase the participation of all citizens in public life. It is vital that all individuals have a voice in the decisions which affect their lives, particularly the most vulnerable, and they must be allowed to do so free from fear and intimidation. More engagement and inclusive participation can only cultivate democracy, enhance the promotion and protection of human rights, prevent violations and abuses, and foster social and economic development. We remain concerned about the situation of children in Eritrea, particularly trafficking in children and the plight of unaccompanied minors. We also share the concern of the Special Rapporteur that the forced evictions described in the report are not only a violation of human rights, but an obstacle to Eritrea's progress in achieving the Millennium Development Goals, impacting on poverty and hunger, children's access to school and gender equality. We note the conclusion contained in the report and reiterated in the report from the Commission of Inquiry that widespread and systematic human rights violations are a trigger for the massive flight of Eritreans from all walks of life from their home countries. Special Rapporteur, we have a question. Your report refers to the gendered effects of forced eviction. Could you elaborate on the specific impacts of these evictions on women? Thank you. Thank you. We shall now turn to our ten list of speakers for national human rights institutions and non-governmental organizations. I give the floor to International Fellowship of Reconciliation. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. The International Fellowship of Reconciliation and Human Rights Concern Eritrea thanks the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights Situation in Eritrea for her update. The Special Rapporteur is right to highlight the issue of forced evictions and demolition of houses in Eritrea. Along with the numerous recommendations that the report makes, we particularly agree that the government of Eritrea must put an immediate end to the practice of forced evictions and demolition of houses and that there is meet mindfulness of international human rights law and practice in this field. Mr. President, the topic of Special Rapporteur's report forced evictions is also sadly true of what is happening across the country as a whole as countless numbers of Eritreans feel they are being forced to flee their country, taking incredible risk to escape the dreadful human rights situation there. We therefore kindly ask the special rapporteur what advice she has for governments of member states which have large numbers of Eritreans desperately seeking refuge within their territories. Would she agree not that it is better to challenge the cause of the problem rather than penalize the symptoms? Mr. President, we urge the Human Rights Council to implement the recommendations outlined in the Special Rapporteur's report. We particularly urge member states to unfailingly continue to ask questions about the root cause of egregious human rights violations in Eritrea. Finally, given that the human rights situation in Eritrea is no way improving and that the Eritrean government continues its policy of denial and non-cooperation with human rights mechanisms appointed by this council, we strongly recommend the anonymous renewal of the mandate of the special rapporteur. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to Conscience and Peace Tax International. You have the floor. Mr. President, we 
commend the report of the Special Reporter on the situation of human rights in Eritrea and thank her for all her effort to highlight the human rights violations taking place in the country. Despite the continued failure of the regime in Eritrea to comply with the mandate and offer her unhindered access. We agree with the Special, reporter, uh, the special Reporter's findings that a great majority of the young Eritreans that are getting caught up in human trafficking and dangerous crossings uh, are actually fleeing forced conscription in the national service with a, num with a number living before their recruitment or running away to avoid roundups. We, partic we are particularly concerned about the plight of children and the fact that many children are easily falling prey of unscrupulous traffic traffickers promising them passage um, passage to, to save heaven. We would, we would have liked the special rapporteur to also look into the pressures the government of Eritrea exerts even on those who have left its clutches. Eritrean nationals residing outside Eritrea as well as individuals of Eritrean descent are forced to pay a 2% tax levied on them on their earning by the Eritrean government to bolster Eritrea's constant war footing. We believe this to be contrary to the free choice of people not to pay for war or for the oppression of their own kin, and it's co contrary to the UN Security Council's Resolution 2023. This year we have also been concerned about the use of the army to forcefully evict thousands of people and demolish their houses, as noted by the special reporter. We fear that the situation might lead to many making the decision to leave the country. Finally, we call on the government of Eritrea to implement all recommendations made by the special reporter, and we, we call on this on this council to, uh, to renew the mandate of the special reporter and the extension of the Commission of Inquiry for, for further investigation of the worsening human rights situation in Eritrea. Thank you. Thank you. I give the floor to East and Horn of Africa Human Rights Defenders and Project. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. My organization welcomes the report of the special rapporteur on human rights situation in Eritrea and appreciate the findings of the Commission of Inquiry on Eritrea. The report points the gross human rights violations, including arbitrary detention, extrajudicial killings, individual national service, and trafficking in person, all being committed against the Eritrean people by allegedly its own government. Mr. President, our organization is concerned by the massive flight of Eritrean victims as immigrants, asylum seekers, and refugees triggered by these human rights violations, including children. The survivors are exposed to more threat across the Sahara and Mediterranean Sea and often endure more violations, including human smuggling, trafficking, as they struggle to find a safe place in Europe and the rest of Africa. We decry the unlawful detention of prisoners for over a long period of time and inhumane and deplorable detention conditions with limited or no access to water, food, fresh air, or medical facilities, including detention in metal containers, some of which are buried underground. We condemn incommunicado detention and solitary confinement as a form of punishment contrary to the international human rights standards. We restate the Social Rapporteur's call to the Eritrea to strengthen the democratic governance institutions and guarantee the independence and impartiality of judiciary to tackle impunity. We further echo the Special Rapporteur's statement that respect for human rights is a vital for democratic state and that these rights should not be sacrificed for short-term political and economic gain. We recommend the renewal of the mandate of the Special Rapporteur. I thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you. I give the floor to the Arab Commission for Human Rights. You have the floor. Uh, Arab Commission. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Let me now give the floor to United Nations Watch. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. UN Watch commends the Special Rapporteur for her report and for her work on the Commission of Inquiry, which both detail how the government of Eritrea has created and sustained a repressive system to deprive their citizens of their fundamental freedoms. The people of Eritrea require this Council's immediate attention. The situation of human rights has deteriorated considerably since the last report of the Special Rapporteur in 2014. Faced with the realities of arbitrary detention, torture, indefinite military service, and severe restrictions on freedoms of expression, association, and religion, 300,000 Eritreans, more than 5% of the population, have fled during the past decade. 
UN Watch is concerned, as documented in the report by the Special Rapporteur and the Commission of Inquiry, by the country's indefinite policy of national service. Each year, thousands of Eritreans, including minors and clerics, are forcibly conscripted and subject to inhumane and slave-like conditions for unspecified periods, often lacking adequate food, water, hygienic facilities, and medical services. UN Watch agrees that unlimited national service in effect amounts to forced labor and is alarmed by the prevalence of early child marriage and teenage pregnancies to avoid recruitment. Mr. President, in Eritrea, thousands of ordinary citizens are arbitrarily arrested and incarcerated without due process. Detainees are held in brutal environments, confined in overcrowded, underground cells with little or no light, extreme weather conditions, and vermin. Beatings, torture, and extrajudicial killings are widely perpetrated and committed with impunity. UN Watch regrets that the most meaningful recommendations made by the Special Rapporteur in her previous reports have not been implemented. Madam Rapporteur, in light of the government's non-cooperation, how could this Council ensure an effective follow-up to your report and that of the COI in order to restore the rule of law in Eritrea and end the government's abusive treatment of its own citizens? I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I give the floor to the Association of World Citizens. You have the floor. Association of World Citizens, are they in the bin? Citizens. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, nous avons suivi ces Eritreans. We have been uh, looking after Eritreans who have arrived en masse, uh, particularly in the UK, uh, for the last 30 or even 40 years. They've always been a, a special case, and I'm going to address the question of care and therapy. They've always been extremely fragile uh, on arrival, and I think we need to take account of this in all of the countries uh, where, which take them in. It's certainly one of the groups with the largest number of suicides in refugee camps when they uh, arrive and they've had a lot of uh, trouble in adapting later on because of their vulnerability, their fragility. Quite certainly they needed to feel safe within a group and they were in such despair that uh, still today they get onto boats well aware of the, the risks they run, uh, but that's so little compared to what they leave behind. Would it be possible to take account of these factors and to give them some sort of special treatment so that they can adapt? Uh, renew their lives. It's, it's so vital for them. Thank you very much. Thank you. I give the floor to Amnesty International. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thousands of prisoners of conscience continue to be held in secret detention in Eritrea without charge or trial for their speech, their writing, their religious beliefs, their suspected political opinions, for trying to escape national service, flee the country or in place of others who have fled. Hundreds of families have not been informed of the arrests or whereabouts of their relatives, have never heard of them, from them since their arrest and do not know if they are alive or dead. As has frequently been described to the Council, torture and other ill treatment are widely used for punishment, interrogation and coercion. Common methods reported include tying prisoners in painful positions for long periods and prolonged solitary confinement. Positive steps taken by Eritrea, such as its accession to the Convention Against Torture, must be translated into genuine action to end torture on the ground, such as investigating allegations of torture and prosecuting those suspected of criminal responsibility. Eritrea has been invited to accept technical assistance to implement recommendations on human rights. So as not to defeat its very purpose, any such assistance must be accompanied by access to Eritrea by the Special Rapporteur and other independent observers to monitor, document and report on the situation. The son of two of the G15 detained in September 2001 said recently of his parents, I don't know their physical condition, 
medical needs and psychological state, but they are very much alive in my heart and in my mind. There are simple steps that the government of Eritrea can take immediately towards improving the human rights situation in the country. As a bare minimum, the government must release its political prisoners, or where this is not possible, at least inform families of their relatives' fate. I thank you. Thank you. I will now give the floor to the country concerned for courtesy final remarks. Uh, Eritrea, you have two minutes. Mr. Vice President, thank you. Uh, my delegation has attentively listened to the interactive dialogue and would like to make the following concluding remarks. From the outset, let me express my delegation's total rejection to the baseless allegations made on Eritrea and what is presented in the report is completely detached from the Eritrean reality on the ground. Yes, there are challenges, problems, shortcomings in the country, but it's far from the reality in the way that is presented in this interactive dialogue. Additionally, the following remarks are made to benefit the objective understanding of the members of this assembly. One, Eritrea reaffirms that it is committed to the advancement of human rights for its people and is not at all related to short-term gains in diplomacy or other relations as described by the Special Rapporteur. Hence, the mainstreaming of human rights at all levels, in all dimensions, all sectors, and in all policies and programs of our nation-building endeavors has been strengthened. In line to this, a framework for action for the follow-up and implementation of the UPR recommendations have also been outlined and has, start, has started implementation. Two, the ongoing efforts and initiative to further consolidate development in general and on human rights in particular in the next four or five years need also to be considered. The government has outlined strategic vision and praxis for the next four years until 2018 to redouble its efforts to fast track development achievements, reorganizations, comprehensive reorganizations on the government state administrative structure and including fast tracking the political process of nation building. Three, the ongoing effort on international cooperation which is now strengthened in accord in across the five dimensions where engagement and cooperation with OHCHR, the implementation of the UPR, bilateral engagements and cooperation, working with the UN country team which are on the ground in Eritrea has also been strengthened. For Thank you, uh, Richard. Do you want to wrap up? I can give you half a minute. Thank you. The criticism on the reservation of Eritrea to Article 20 of the International Convention Against Torture that the Special Rapporteur has mentioned also exceeds her mandate. In a different issue, Mr. Vice President, the point I mentioned, my delegation has been briefed by the Special Rapporteur that she was assaulted by an individual in front of the office of the UN where police forces were deployed. Without questioning the veracity of the event, I believe such incidents should have been reported to police at the moment and remains a case between the two. I Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much. Um, let me now give the floor to uh, Ms. Sheila Keitha Ruth for your concluding remarks. You have 20 minutes, madam. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. I would have liked probably to take one point uh, which uh, has been mentioned. I would like to elaborate uh, on uh, um, the specifics of, uh, of uh, what exactly I meant with regards to respecting the rights to housing uh, in, uh, in Eritrea. How is the right to housing a human rights issue and how does that impact on MDGs? It's a very important link which I would like to, to make. Um, and all the uh, important critical issues around that. Uh, I'd like to go back to the issue of how the Universal Declaration of Human Rights provides for the right to an adequate standard of living, which includes the right to adequate housing which is 
of central importance for the enjoyment of all economic, social and cultural rights and all other rights, civil and political. The right to adequate housing is also established in the International Covenant uh, on Economic, Social uh, and Cultural uh, Rights, to which Eritrea is a party. What I'm trying to say is that there is a direct link between the right to housing, which is the focus of my report, and other rights, civil and political, which are also part of what Eritrea has, uh, has accepted as its uh, obligations. Um, what, uh, in meeting these obligations in the context of the right to adequate housing, Eritrea is obligated to, amongst other things, refrain from carrying out forced evictions bearing exceptional circumstances with justification and sufficient notice. Consult with affected communities and solicit their participation. Hold individual, uh, the individuals to account, including third parties who implement forced evictions. Provide remedies and respect due process for people who have been evicted. Provide alternative housing compensation and rehabilitation. Now in my report I document the recent incidents that are contrary to these principles and standards. They focused on forced evictions and the lack of available affordable and adequate housing which is not only a violation of the right to ad adequate housing but also in contradiction with the Millennium Development Goals for which Eritrea has reportedly made significant uh, progress. Um, how do that link? If housing is affected, it definitely impacts on the right to health, on uh, the right of uh, women to enjoy uh, their human rights. So there is, in my mind, a, a, it, they, are in, uh, they are really linked. These issues are very linked. Which brings me to the question which has been posed uh, in terms of the gendered ac uh, um, aspect, effects of uh, forced evictions. Um, I, would like to, um, I would like to raise uh, some of the issues. Uh, in many of the houses uh, which have been demolished, in many of the communities, Women were those who were taking care of, uh, uh, of the family, who were there, etc. So they were easy targets in terms of the demolition. So the impact has been not only on their own rights, but also on the family, and also um, they've been affected by the fact that the, their own family life is already impacted on by the f uh, many of the fleeing, um, the people who flee, their children, husbands, etc., etc. So they are left there vulnerable. So that's one of the uh, very, uh, you know, it has a, the destruction of the houses then uh, through for and shelter through forced eviction has a chain effect on other rights. So which impacts on uh, security, on life, etc., uh, of women, but also on other members uh, of the community. Now, uh, the other aspect uh, I'd like to, uh, to raise um, is uh, um, what would be the new areas that uh, I'd like to concentrate on uh, as Special Rapporteur. Um, I believe that some of the uh, important aspects would be some of the follow-ups which re are required from the report of the Commission of Inquiry, but also I had established on, when I started the mandate a number of action points and uh, a number of uh, priority areas and action points. I will need to review those uh, priority areas and action points in terms of what has happened. The, uh, though I have not had the benefit of having um, direct communication with uh, Eritrea on 
substantive issues of uh, human rights, there has been many other in instances where the country has, uh, has appeared. The CEDAW committee, the CRC committee, the UPR, that's where I will be able to gather some of the priority areas and also my own investigations which, uh, which I have made. Um, I would um, really want to say that uh, it's um, some of the, you know, review the ones which are, which are out there. I still believe that the incarceration as well as, uh, uh, as uh, incommunicado detention remains uh, uh, something which requires uh, scrutiny. The national service and its impact on, uh, on the country and on people generally is important. The other aspect which is very important uh, also um, relates to how all this affects uh, the population and uh, also, uh, you know, uh, look at uh, uh, my, my concern would be to still make sure and it will remain one of my priority areas as uh, the special rapporteur if the mandate is renewed that the mandate renew, uh, remains that safe place where everyone can communicate on human rights issues with the special rapporteur. So, um, you know, uh, these are some of the uh, elements uh, which I would like to, uh, to focus on and also incorporating elements such as the exodus of people, uh, including uh, unaccompanied minors. This is um, the issue of unaccompanied minors is something which I brought to the attention of the Council right from my very first report and I would like to continue putting a focus on, uh, on that very vulnerable group of, uh, of uh, people. Um, so these are some of the new, some of the areas I need to concentrate on, but at the same time I would like to also review, look at the issue of economic and social rights in Eritrea. There are some issues which are coming out through the conversations that I've been having with different people, different stakeholders, and which I would want to absolutely continue uh, with the government uh, of Eritrea also, and uh, look forward to doing that. Well, migration remains a very, very important point, and uh, I'm very concerned about that too. And um, I, um, I would uh, I would simply say on that is those who leave, my, my research has linked those who leave, why, the reasons of why those uh, people who leave very much to the uh, human rights violations that they have, uh, that they have uh, been subjected to in the country. So that would be an area I will continue looking at, gathering the issues in terms of, uh, in terms of what makes people, what is the trigger for uh, exodus, but my call is really to ensure that people who are crossing, who people who cross borders are given the necessary protection. And to this, uh, I, would, I would really like to say that uh, I would like to not only remind Eritrea, but make an appeal to the international uh, community that trading human rights for short-term political or economic gains would undermine the long-term enjoyment of all human rights by all in Eritrea. This is where we need to be very careful. The root causes, what would be a better uh, environment for enjoyment of all human rights uh, in Eritrea? Um, also, uh, with regards to effective uh, follow-up, uh, I keep saying, for example, the bilaterals are very important, but also the respect uh, by Eritrea, the political will to respect its own obligations and to engage in a constructive dialogue. I do look forward to that constructive dialogue on substantive human rights issues, which I have raised not only in this, uh, in this report, but also in my previous reports, which unfortunately till today the recommendations have not been implemented. So these are some of the areas which I think uh, are very uh, important. Um, 
I would want uh, also to quickly say that uh, the issue of uh, business and human rights in Eritrea, if it is one of the priorities, if we, if according to um, the assessment that I will make uh, as I go along, if it is one of the prior, if it comes out as one of the priorities, I will definitely look at it. Uh, but that depends really on uh, on how. Uh, I, the assessment, I, how I assess the priorities, which are the most pressing at this particular moment in time, which is like three years down the line in the mandate of the Special Rapporteur. Um, these are some of the uh, issues uh, I wanted to raise, uh, Mr. President, uh, and uh, also uh, would like to ensure that, uh, um, you know, uh, I respond to one very particular uh, aspect uh, which has been brought uh, by, by Eritrea, by the, by the distinguished uh, general, um, representative of uh, Eritrea. I again would like to reassure the Council that I was very particular in maintaining the difference between the two mandates. I made it a point to explain all, always how the, in what capacity I was speaking and what kind of information I, I was gathering for which report. So uh, I would like again to ensure that uh, this was really part of uh, uh, part of the uh, I was very conscious about uh, this aspect and ensured that the integrity was maintained. Um, now uh, probably uh, just to quickly talk about uh, some of the steps uh, I would, or probably the, to respond, uh, you know, to the claim that uh, Eritrea is opening up, which I have already talked about, but I would like to reinforce the fact that one can't do things halfway. One needs to go to the full length of the obligations and that uh, respectful of my mandate, and this is exactly what I'm re uh, recommending, that uh, you know, uh, any idea of human rights is taken to its full length. Any response to a human rights issue is taken uh, to its uh, full length. Um, that's basically what I would like to, uh, to raise uh, at this point and uh, remain available for further uh, clarification. Thank you, Madam. Um, colleagues, uh, this brings us to the end of the interactive dialogue with the Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Eritrea. I wish to thank Ms. Sheila Ketharuth for her report and presence uh, with us here today. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we shall now hold a short break. We shall have a short break before we begin the general debate under item four. So we shall have a short break. Thank you. <laughs>